All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all having a nice weekend. Just like last week, there's going to be I think there's going to be some pretty good opportunities for trading this week. One of the problems most newer traders have is they feel like they always need to be active. But what veteran traders will tell you, it's okay to be on the sidelines and be patient and wait for something good to come along. You don't want to force it. You don't want to overtrade. So when I was back in the institutional trading world, one of the things that we would always go over on our research meetings and Monday morning is what's going on with the different sectors. Oh, and yes, 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 there's hedge funds included. Everyone is so freaking obsessed with hedge funds. You know, there's mutual funds, there's institutional funds. It doesn't need to be a hedge fund. And a lot of hedge funds go out of business. And a lot of hedge funds don't do a good job. And the only difference between like a hedge fund and a different fund is the fee structure. A hedge fund could be very boring. It could be long-term value buy and hold. It could also be very complicated. It could be high frequency leverage. It's just the difference between a hedge fund and another fund is the fee structure. In a hedge fund, the manager, if they do a good job, they get what we call a performance fee, part of the action, part of the profit. They get a management fee and a performance fee. The management fee is the fee for managing. It's usually pretty small, maybe 1% or 2%. In, say, the mutual fund world, there is no performance fee. All they get is a management fee. It could be the same strategies and blah, blah, blah. So 20 years ago, the thought was like, all right, well, if you're really good at what you do, you would go work at a hedge fund because you'll make a lot more money. But as it turns out, some of these hedge funds – are not as whatever, as good as people think. So anyway, don't be obsessed or, or you know, whatever. Fall like, oh, he's a former hedge fund trader, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. If you want to learn how the markets really work and how trading works, just check in with me because I've been here for a long time. Or I should say I was there for a long time. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. So please subscribe. Tell your friends. Uh, right now, subscribe, okay? All right. So one of the things that we would do is look at the sectors. So what I'm going to do is bring up the SPY um, ETF fact sheet here. We're going to look at the holdings. And these are the sectors, right? Different sectors are in the driver's seat at different times. And wow, information technologies, which is basically tech, it's gotten up to 31.4%. Like two months ago, this was like a 28%. So it just shows you how well tech is done. But now tech is going down. Here are some of the, the other sectors, financials, industrials. Communication services, healthcare, discretionary. And if you're interested in a sector, in other words, different sectors drive the market at different times. Different things are in the driver's seat at different times. So if you can identify the sector, that's great. If you want to take it another step farther, you can look at the stocks that are within the sector. So for example, say we're looking at healthcare, it's 12% of the market. Just like we can look at the SPY fact sheet, we can bring up the sector ETF fact sheet. Okay, here is the healthcare sector. And we could see, right, what's going on in here. Eli Lilly is the biggest company. Wow, that's another big change. I mean, United Healthcare was the biggest company for a long time, but Eli Lilly has taken over. So anyway, it really just kind of depends on how far down you want to bring it. It's like an umbrella or like those like Russian doll things. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but I will tell you this. If you're trading SPY, you should really spend some time looking at this stuff because... It's going to help you. I mean, I mean, I don't even know what else to say. All right. Anyway, that being said, let's go take a look at SPY, the S&P 500 ETF. And, you know, kind of had a big move. Well, I don't know. Kind of had a move. After this big, massive sell-off, you know, it's not surprising we got a little bit of a rebound here. I, I don't think there's going to be some fo any follow-through. But let's go and pale the layers off the onion. Ooh, I'm going to start saying that. Let's look at the sectors. So as we just saw, the biggest sector is technology. Let's look at the technology sector. Now, tech is like, you know, I mean, this sector still looks really weak to me. A couple of things to point out here. One is notice how we found support at the price level that had been support before. And... It was support because it was resistance. Some levels are more important than others, all right? This is one of them. People sell here, and the price goes higher, and a lot of the people that sold here, at first they thought they did the right thing, 
But then the price goes higher and they're like, oh, I made a mistake. If it gets back to my price, I'm going to buy my shares back. So you tend to get support at levels that were resistance before. Another manifestation of seller's remorse in a market is you tend to get support at levels that were support before. Just like there are people that sold here that are remorseful that are trying to buy back over here. There are people who sold here who are remorseful trying to buy back over here. So if you really want to be a successful trader, you know, there's a couple two things to it. Biggest is psychology, but right up there in the top couple of things is just knowing where the important price levels are. If you know where the important price levels are, well, that's where markets tend to change their trends. So, you know, it's pretty simple. You don't need to be a former hedge fund trader to see that. All right. I just want to look real quick at our big three, Microsoft, before I go into these other sectors here. You know, Microsoft, what happens? Found support at a level that was support before. Uh, Apple. Oh, this is, if there's one thing to watch in the market this week, it's this. All right. Apple is right on this important support. This is what we talked about, right? What was support can become resistance. As goes Apple, as goes the tech sector, and I think as goes the broader market. I mean, it, sometimes the markets are complicated. You don't really know what to watch. Sometimes the markets are easy. And I think this is going to be a pretty easy one. I mean, because whatever Apple does is going to dictate what goes on in the front, broader market. Here's an example where what was support can turn into resistance. This is another example of important price levels. Because there's now this is not seller's remorse, this is buyer's remorse. There's people who bought here. And, you know, they thought they knew what the hell they were doing, but they didn't sell up here. When the price finally went lower, a lot of them say, I made a mistake. If I can get out of break even, um, it's done. So when it gets up to a, a level that had been a support level, you get these remorseful buyers place and sell orders. And if there's enough of them, it can turn support into resistance. And that's what's happened here. All right. Next biggest sector was what? Financials. Financials and healthcare kind of shift back and forth. You know, it's all market weighted. So, all right. So financials, you know, doing pretty well here. Again, what was resistance became support. Financials look good. Just want to take another quick look at the tech sector there. Yeah. So tech looks pretty weak. All right. Let's go look at healthcare. Healthcare looks okay. What's the next biggest sector? I know this, but I'm just trying to show you. It's a very good way to find trading ideas. You know, people overthink trading. It doesn't need to be that complicated. Wall Street likes to make things seem complicated so they can charge fees or people have, you know, egos. It, it, my partner, Berlin, says you don't need to overthink it, underthink it. And I think that is, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but it's actually quite profound. All right. Now, look at this. So here is our consumer discretionary sector. What happens? You get in this massive sell-off. Where do we find support? Here, was it just a coincidence around 180? Or was it because it was a resistance level before? Is it because people that sold here re who regretted doing so when the price went higher are trying to buy their shares back? Or is it just some random coincidence in the universe? I mean, I don't know. You know, you have your opinion, I have mine. But I was in the, you know, an institutional trader for more than two decades and it's so one of the things you look for. Something's going down. You're wondering, like, where the hell should I buy it? You don't just guess. You don't just say, oh, I'll buy it if it gets to 185. I'll buy it if it gets to 175. You look at the chart and you let the chart tell you what to do. That's what, this is, you know, good traders let the market tell them what to do. And if you have an opinion, that could be a very dangerous thing because you could be wrong. I could be wrong. We each know we are a lot of times. But the market is never wrong. So let the market tell you what to do. How does the market let you tell you what to do? How it acts when it gets these price levels of importance. All right. Next biggest sector, communication services. This is like the home of Google and Facebook. People call them big tech. But, you know, in reality, they're really part of the communication services sector. Again, what happened? We sell off. What did we do? We found support at a level that was resistance. So if this thing is going down, and you're like, where the hell should I buy it? I want to buy it. You know, you don't just want to pull a number out of your, you know, you, out of the air. You want to say like, okay, well, 
hmm, let me think about this. What does the market say? Oh, the market says there was resistance around this level. I would call it, say, 83, maybe 82 and a half. That's where we found support. Amazon is, you know, Amazon, believe it or not, is a member of the consumer discretionary sector. It's called big tech. And, and, and one, I mean, it's like you can't look at these charts without seeing this. Where did Amazon find support? The level that was support before. All right. I mean, you know, I know it's I sound like I'm kicking a dead horse to death here. But like I tell people, you know, if you're a mechanic, what do you do? If you're an auto mechanic. Well, you work on, you know, transmissions every day or you work on starters or whatever. If you're a trader, what do you do? You look for price levels that are important. Because when we get to them, that's where we tend to get moves. Like, look at this support. You know, we got a little bit of a false breakout here. And then we had some big move on the downside. This is our industrial sector. But support at a former support level, resistance at a former resistance level. All right. Now we're going to go into uh, consumer staples is a small sector. But sometimes before the market goes down, money flows into this. It's a flight to safety. You know, money managers perceive that this will go down less. And sometimes in the institutional world, you're beholden to have a full exposure to equities. That's what your clients signed a contract with you to do. So even if you're, you know, even if you're money, if you're a money manager, and even if you think the market's going to crash, it's going to go down, you might not have that luxury of just being able to go over into cash or to buy puts. For instance, if you're in a mutual fund manager, <coughs> excuse me, if you're a mutual fund manager, you know, mutual funds generally can't hold more than 5% in cash. And generally, they can't get short positions and they can't buy futures. So you might be a mutual fund manager. You might think, you know, this market sucks. It's going to go lower. But I got to stay fully invested. So I'm going to sell the stuff I perceive to be risky and put it in the stuff I perceive to be less risky. So that could be consumer staples. All right. Uh, energy is small. But sometimes energy can influence the broader markets because it's so important. So let's just take a quick look at our energy ETF. Yeah, not too much going on here. All right. Then we got utilities. All right. Eh, don't see any trading things there. We got basic materials. Look at this, right? You know, to mean to be a market guru to see this. Running into resistance at a former resistance level. I mean, think about it. This is a relatively speaking a small sector, but it's still worth trillions and trillions of dollars. And where do we find resistance? Within pennies of the level that was resistance back in May. This is buyer's remorse. There's people who bought up here who regret doing so, and the price goes lower, and they're like, oh, if it ever gets back to my price, I can get out of break even. I'm going to. So remorseful buyers from here, placing sell orders over here, keeps support intact. Now, what the hell did I do over here? Oh, there we go. All right. Oh, one more sector, real estate. X-L-R-E. Yeah, you know, you could kind of see some of the similar action here. Ran into resistance at a former resistance level. Resistance over here becomes support. So to all you people that are getting, you know, just starting out with trading, um, you know, don't overthink it, underthink it, worry about the trends, worry about the levels. If you have a mistake, get out when it's a small thing. You're not always going to be right. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. All right, everybody. So that being said, if you have any questions, hit me up here on YouTube or marketstockmarketjobber.com. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you don't think you can be a successful trader, you're wrong. You're probably just paying attention to the wrong things. All right, everyone. I'll see you all tomorrow morning.